chapter about Jewish Houston in the book, Making Houston Modern, A Life and Architecture of Howard Barnstone, which was published this year by the University of Texas Press. He also authored an essay on migration in American Jewish history for the volume, Interpreting American Jewish History at Museums and Historic Sites, published in 2016 by Rowan and Littlefield. Currently, Dr. Furman is working on an article about Jews who immigrated to the United States through Galveston, and his long-term plans involve writing a book about the history of Houston's Jewish community. Dr. Furman received his PhD in modern Jewish history from the University of Maryland in 2015, and we are so pleased that you've made time for, for us uh, and to be with us this morning uh, and this afternoon. We are all very excited for what you have to say. So everyone, please welcome Joshua Furman. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I hope you can uh, see me and hear me okay. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you, and I want to thank uh, David and Miriam Friedman for the invitation to join you this month. Um, today, what I'm going to try to do is, first of all, give an introduction to the Houston Jewish History Archive uh, for those of you learning about us for the very first time. Uh, and then what I'll do is to take you on a, a little bit of a virtual tour of some of the highlights uh, of our collection. And in consultation with David, what I've chosen to do today is to try to spotlight some of the uh, wonderful things that we have in our collections that relate to uh, Beth Israel history and the history of uh, some Beth Israel families. Um, it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we have here at the archive, um, as, you'll, as you'll see. And I'm hoping that we'll also have the opportunity for lots of questions and um, discussion as well. So um, I'm going to be showing a PowerPoint presentation. And um, what I'll try to do is about every 10 minutes or so, I'll try to pause it and pop out. And if you have a comment or a question, um, you may want to type it into the chat window as we go along so that you don't lose track of it. Um, and I will excuse me, try to address as many of those as I can. So without further ado, here we go. So the uh, Houston Jewish History Archive was um, formally launched in 2018, but the roots of it, as you'll see, um, go, back, go back to 2017. Our mission here at the archive is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the documents, photographs, artifacts, and memories that tell the story of Jewish life in Greater Houston and also in South Texas, and to make sure that these materials will be available in perpetuity to researchers, scholars, genealogists, and family members, um, and that we never again risk losing our precious communal history to another flood or natural disaster. Um, the HJHA, as we call it, is a collaboration between the program in Jewish studies, of which I'm a faculty member, and the Wilton Research Center in Fondren Library, which is our special collections division. Um, increasingly, as we've built out the archive uh, over the last uh, couple years, with tremendous um, community support, as well as um, funding from uh, many family foundations and professional organizations, we've realized that you can't just um, collect Houston Jewish history because so many Houston Jewish families didn't start out in Houston. They came through Galveston or they settled in a bunch of small towns uh, throughout the state. And so increasingly, um, as we were just talking about Wharton um, before the program uh, started, we collect material about a, a dozen um, communities or so throughout South Texas. And the number is always growing. So you see here Galveston, Wharton, Beaumont, Baytown, uh, Schulenburg, um, Victoria, and increasingly now we're, we're focused on Corpus Christi in San Antonio and, and growing, our, growing our reach in what we do. Um, our scope of activities includes collecting and acquiring documents, photographs, artifacts, and other materials, even audio and video recordings related to Texas Jewish history um, as much as possible. And especially now during the pandemic, we are trying to digitize this material and make it accessible to you online at a time when it's not uh, possible for you to visit us on campus because of the pandemic. We try to bring the archive to you um, through our digitization initiative. 
We conduct oral histories, as I'll be telling you more about later. And we sponsor exhibits, lectures, and public programs uh, throughout the community, such as this one. We have a website uh, and a Facebook page, and we're now on Instagram, so you can follow us on social media through uh, various platforms as well. I want to just spend a few minutes now telling you the story of, of how it was that the archive came into being. We had just begun to have some internal conversations in the program in Jewish studies at Rice, um, myself and the director of Jewish studies, Matthias Henze, earlier in 2017, when Hurricane Harvey um, hit us and hit us very hard uh, that summer. And in the days after the storm, I began to grow concerned that there was nobody on the ground uh, in Houston with the capability of trying to collect and preserve historical material in synagogues that had flooded. Um, and so kind of, you know, a, a very grassroots spontaneous effort. My wife, Alicia, and I uh, went to United Orthodox Synagogues first in early September of 2017. And here you can see we were wearing masks before it was before it was trendy, um, and we we went into that flooded synagogue a few days after the storm, and we pulled out whatever historical records we could find, and laid them out on on tables. We put pieces of white computer paper between the pages of these old books to try to dry them out and preserve them. And actually, my uh, one of the books that we managed to save is this cemetery map and membership directory of Adathemeth, which is one of the oldest Orthodox synagogues in the city uh, from February of 1935. And one of the things that I always try to stress in doing this work is that so many of the precious documents and photographs that we come into possession of here at the archive, there's only one copy of it in the world, right? So if we lose this um, cemetery map, it's gone forever. We can't go to Barnes and Noble. We can't go on amazon.com and find another copy. This is a one of one. And so it really adds a, a layer of um, urgency to this work, but also the, the thrill of knowing that, you know, we're able to preserve this for future generations is just, it, it's an unparalleled feeling. I can't, I can't describe it. And my colleagues and I are just very blessed and fortunate to be able to do this work. The way that this cemetery map got preserved is that my colleague, Dr. Melissa Kane, uh, who's recently retired, but has been for many years, the official historian of Rice University, took this book home and stood with a blow dryer, just going page by page to, you know, get rid of the moisture and try to dry this thing out. Uh, and she did, and we managed to save this book. And we're in the very early stages now of creating a digital map of where Adith um members were living in, in the Fifth Ward of Houston in 1935. It's pretty exciting. So um, from UOS, we went on to Beth Yashurin and assisted in recovery efforts there. Um, sadly, by the time we got there, Harvey had already done pretty significant damage to the archives of Beth Yashurin. And you can see here on your screen, sadly, what floodwaters uh, does to historic photographs in, in terms of in terms of damage. Uh, luckily, however, uh, we we did manage to save a significant portion of uh, Beth Yashurin's historical material, and much of it has now been donated um, to Rice University for preservation and digitization, which is really great. So, in a nutshell, what we collect here at the archive has to pertain to the Texas Jewish experience in some way, um, but. That is a pretty broad category. So we have material that families have donated to us, scrapbooks, family photographs, um, diaries and, and letters. We have Jewish life cycle uh, historical materials, confirmation photographs, bar and bat mitzvah photographs, wedding programs and photos, um, and speeches. We love you know, bar and bat mitzvah speeches and uh, confirmation speeches. And actually you, you may get to see a confirmation scrapbook from Beth Israel a little later on today. Uh, we are the custodian of institutional records for many organizations in the Houston Jewish community, uh, including many synagogues, organizations, and Jewish-owned businesses. Um, we have an exciting collection. I won't be talking about it today, but we have an exciting collection of materials from Texas Jewish military veterans, 
Um, we have some large artifacts. We accept them on a case by case basis. And uh, we have some uh, audio and video recordings, including sermons of uh, Houston rabbis, radio programs, uh, cantorial music, and some other stuff like that. What we don't collect by and large are general Judaica. So old uh, Sidurim, old prayer books with no clear Texas connection, um, you know, old mass market Judaica books we don't, we don't accept here at the archive. Uh, and we also don't typically accept uh, photocopies or reproductions of things. We um, uh, invest a lot of uh, money and resources and expertise in preserving original uh, rare documents and photographs. And um, however, having said that, we're usually happy to make a physical copy or a digital copy for our donors um, who are, are willing to partner with us to preserve either their family history or their institutional history. So um, the archives, the, our, our home base is, as I said, the Woodson Research Center at Rice University. And this is our reading room. Um, in pre-pandemic times, and I hope in the not too distant post-pandemic future, uh, this is a public space. So anybody uh, can come to Fondren Library on the Rice campus and visit the archives to look at our materials. Our visiting hours are uh, Monday through Friday, nine to four. However, because of the current pandemic, uh, we are closed. We are closed to non-Rice affiliated visitors. Um, but the idea of this project really is to create a resource that doesn't just benefit Rice, uh, but that really benefits the entire community and serves as a, as a resource um, for all of us who are curious about Texas Jewish history. Uh, what you'll see when you, when you do visit is this space, the reading room. What you won't see uh, is this. This is um, uh, part of our storage facility where our uh, collections are stored. It's a temperature controlled secure facility. And collections when they're donated to us uh, are processed by our, our archivists and our uh, student interns. They're organized into boxes and folders, which are acid free, and then they're stored um, here on the shelves as you can as you can kind of see. So that in a nutshell is uh, what the archive is and uh, how and why we, we started this work. Um, and we've been very, very fortunate um, to have received support from the Stanford and Joan Alexander Foundation and from the um, David and Shirley Tuman Foundation and, and, and others as well. Let me now see what um, questions have come up in the um, chat. Uh, hello, Malcolm. Um, we don't have information about um, the Klein family of LaGrange, but I'd be very happy to speak with you um, offline about that. Keep the questions and comments coming, please. Um, I really do hope this will be a uh, participatory and, 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 and lively presentation. So what I'm going to do now is try to show you uh, just a fraction of some of the highlights in our collection. Um, before I say that, though, I really should give a lot of credit to um, the librarian uh, at Beth Israel, Judy Weedman, who is just a fantastic resource on Beth Israel history. And Beth Israel is, is one of the few synagogues in our community um, fortunate enough to have uh, its own archives and its own um, really wonderful collection. And it's been a very fruitful partnership with us working with Beth Israel and working with Judy. Um, they've shared many duplicates in their uh, archives with us. And as we've... Uh, uh, acquired Beth Israel historical materials of interest, we always make a point of sharing uh, with them. So it's a very fruitful partnership. And um, everyone watching this program should know that the first resource for Beth Israel history is really Judy and, 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 and your own uh, wonderful archives. Uh, but having said that, we, we do have some pretty neat stuff um, that I can show you today. And it gives you a sense not only of a little bit of some of the early history of Beth Israel, uh, which some of you may, may already know, uh, but also the wide variety of um, materials that we at the archive here like to collect, such as this uh, postcard image of Beth Israel's second building, uh, which I bought on eBay. eBay is, um, I'm probably giving too much away here, but eBay is a wonderful source of um, acquiring Texas Judaica. You wouldn't believe what people 
um, are, are looking to get rid of and, and sell. So anyway, this is one of my favorite images. We, we actually use this image in a lot of uh, archive publicity. It's quite, quite lovely. And you'll see, you'll see a very familiar photograph um, of this same building in a few minutes. One of the earliest um, Jewish settlers in, in Texas whose family um, has had a long association with uh, Beth Israel uh, was this man, Louis Levy, um, who died in 1861 and uh, who's buried in the West Dallas um, Cemetery. And Louis Levy wrote in 1850, and we don't have an original copy of this um, newspaper in the archive, unfortunately, but I almost any presentation that I give on Houston Jewish history, I just love um, to include and, and to read this newspaper editorial. So Louis Levy, again, early Houston Jewish settler, wrote this editorial for the Asmonean, which was a, a national American Jewish newspaper in June of 1850. And he wrote it with the intention of trying to recruit more Jews to come to Texas and Houston. And here's a snippet of what he wrote. In our own state, thousands of acres of land can be bought within the settled portions of the state for the small sum of from 25 cents to a dollar per acre. Good, arable, fertile land where a man can make his living to his liking and more independent than the autocrat of Russia or the emperor of Austria themselves. Indeed, I would not exchange my 15 acre lot with the house on it and the garden around it, which I possess near the city of Houston for all thrones and hereditary dominions of both those noted persons. For we will see if we live who will have a shelter of their own 15 years from now? Um, just really an in incredible excerpt from somebody, uh, one, of, one of Houston's earliest boosters. And, you know, one of the things that I love about this, of course, is this idea that Houston and, and Texas really offered Jews um, not only safety and security, but also. Um, opportunity, right? That economic opportunity could be, could be found here in, in Texas. Um, you can't talk about the early history of Jewish Houston, of course, without talking about the oldest house of worship in the entire state of Texas, Congregation um, Beth Israel. Uh, chartered in 1859, although some date the history of the congregation to 1854. Um, you see here the Beth Israel Cemetery. Um, at 1207 West Dallas, uh, which dates to 1844. And um, the very first building that Beth Israel constructed um, in 1874 at Crawford and uh, Franklin Avenues. And one of the neat things that I can show you here is um, a photograph that we acquired uh, courtesy of the Houston Chronicle archives. This is a picture of Rabbi Schachtel uh, gesturing to that building, that uh, Crawford and Franklin building, uh, together with Maurice Dannenbaum and president of the congregation at that time, Joe Endelman, uh, in 1970, uh, not long before that building was, was torn down and, and destroyed. Um, really just, you know, an incredible image. And uh, you, can, you can see, you know, what, what became of the building. I guess it was, uh, you know, for ma manufacturing tents and awnings. Um, at the time that the photo was taken in 1970. So that's, that's Beth Israel's first building. Its second building here again is the image of the, that building from that postcard that we saw a few moments ago. Um, this was Beth Israel's second location, uh, which stood at the corner of uh, Crawford and Lamar streets. Uh, it was constructed in um, 1908. And um, this building has a very interesting history. Uh, it served Beth Israel from uh, 1908 to 1925, at which point Beth Israel actually sold the building to another Jewish congregation in Houston, Temple Beth El, which was um, Houston's very first conservative synagogue. And one of the synagogues, if you know your Houston Jewish community, that would later merge to become Beth Yeshurun in 1946. So after Beth Israel occupied this building. It was um, Congregation Beth El. When Beth El merged with Adolph Yashurin to form Beth Yashurin, this building became a church 
Um, and then I think at some point in the 1970s, uh, it was torn down and it's now part of the area around um, the convention center. Uh, but this is a, a really great uh, striking photograph of that second building that we have in our collections. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will remember Beth Israel's third building, uh, which still stands at the corner of Austin and, and Holman Streets, um, and uh, was in use uh, by Beth Israel from the 1920s until 1967. Um, today, it's a, it's a theater, and it's affiliated with the Houston Community College system. It also stood, um, I guess, kind of catty corner, if you will, to the old San Jacinto High School, which many generations of uh, Jewish kids in Houston grew up, grew up attending. Um, and then here, finally, just a little bit of Beth Israel architectural history um, is a picture in our collections of the present building uh, at South Braceswood being constructed in 1967. Um, it's fun to see. And, and I, I always like looking at the cars, um, too, in some of these older um, older images. So uh, a little bit of, of architectural history for you today. Um, and then just a little bit of um, rabbinic history. Beth Israel has been um, fortunate to have been served by a, a long line of uh, distinguished and prestigious rabbis. Um, rabbi Barnson was not the first uh, rabbi in Beth Israel's history, but he enjoyed a very, very long uh, tenure here. Um, he, like his successor, who we'll talk about momentarily, was um, uh, British, and uh, Rabbi Barnson left a very rich legacy, not only uh, for Beth Israel, but also for the Houston Jewish community. Uh, he wrote the earliest history of the Jews of Houston. Uh, this is a document that we uh, have in our archives, and Beth Israel does as well, um, and it, it's only, I think, three or four pages long. Uh, because at the time it was written, there wasn't a whole lot of history to be covered. Um, but it, it opens with this um, memorable line, the history of the city of Houston reads like a romance. Um, and you can see here, I'm not going to read it, but you can take a few minutes and just look at it on your screen. Um, Barnston was uh, very much a scholar, very well respected in the wider um, Houston community. One of the things that you'll, you'll note here is that many of the earliest families of Beth Israel are uh, named here as well. So it's very useful for that kind of genealogical work. Uh, Rabbi Barnson um, is uh, pictured here in our collections, uh, giving the benediction, or I guess here he's holding a cigarette. But earlier, uh, he uh, gave the commencement uh, or gave the uh, address uh, at uh, Rice University's, then Rice Institute's commencement in 1926. That's uh, Edgar Odell Lovett there uh, on the right. And uh, here's a letter that uh, came to us from uh, one of our families that's donated uh, archival treasures to us. This is a handwritten letter from uh, Dr. Barnston. He would have gone by Dr. Barnston, not so much Rabbi Barnston, um, to uh, Audrey Levy of Galveston, who was celebrating a confirmation in June of 1929. Um, and this is great. So he writes, my dear Audrey, so in a few days, you will be a full-fledged confirmant, a daughter of the covenant. Well, dear, you know you have my heartfelt wishes for a long life of health, happiness, and usefulness. In broad outline, we have the religion of the future. And so it's a great privilege to be a Jewess. You have a fine background, and so I know you will always remain loyal, transmitting the tradition which you have received from your parents and forebears to future generations. Um, one, of the, one of the constant joys of, of this work is that uh, this letter, which was donated to us uh, by uh, Robert Levy, uh, who's president of uh, UOS, United Orthodox Synagogues, was, you know, he was sitting in an envelope in a, in a cardboard box. And uh, you know, we didn't even we didn't even know it was there, uh, Robert and I, when we began looking through some of his family's treasures. And it's an illustration of you know how many families in Houston and, and all over the world have you know have these things that their parents and grandparents have kept, and what a privilege it is to be able to you know preserve these things and, and make them available. So um, those are some of our um, 
uh, Henry Barnston uh, files. And I'm sure, again, that Beth Israel archives have, have much more material. Um, so uh, Dr. Barnston was succeeded by Rabbi Hyman Judah Shachtel, uh, who came to uh, Houston in the 1940s. Um, I don't have time in this presentation to talk about um, that history, but uh, Rabbi Shachtel, like Rabbi Barnston before him, uh, left really an indelible legacy on Beth Israel and um, on the city of Houston. And um, we have uh, acquired uh, some pretty wonderful uh, photographs and other materials um, of his uh, from the Shachtel family. Here is um, Rabbi Shachtel's ordination class photograph uh, from the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati in 1931. Can you find him? You see him? Third row from the top, he's about six from the left. If you can spot him. If you, uh, if you see the, the Jewish star, the Megan David on the left, and you kind of follow your eyes down, 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 he's the second person you'll see. Um, so we, we received this uh, from the family. Um, let's see if this, um, if this works. We also uh, have managed to acquire some from um, the Shachtel family and some from other sources, some audio recordings of Rabbi Shachtel. And I'm going to try uh, to play one of these for you now. I take great pleasure in introducing Rabbi Hyman Judah Shachtel, who will speak to you from Houston. Thank you, Rabbi Wise. It has been several years since I've had the privilege of participating in the Message of Israel program. When I last spoke over this network, I was a rabbi in one of the congregations in New York City. For the past four years, I have the honor of being senior rabbi of the oldest organized Jewish house of worship in the state of Texas, founded in 1854. To those of you who have some knowledge of the distinguished rabbinical leadership of the Lone Star State, of men like Dr. Lefkowitz of Dallas, Dr. Barnston of Houston, the late Dr. Zelanka of El Paso, there will immediately come to mind the name and the remarkable ministry of Dr. Henry Cohn of Galveston, who is known not only as the man who stayed in Texas, but as the man who has done as much, if not more, than any other spiritual leader in making God's presence felt in the lives of the people of the Southwest. I am happy to report to the many friends of Dr. Cohen throughout the country that today at the age of 84, Dr. Cohen is in good health and working as hard as ever from morning to night in the vineyard of the Lord. Wow. So anyway, that's, um, that's really amazing. And we're, we're very grateful um, to be able to have preserved and, and digitized that. I'm gonna, again, as I promised, just uh, pop out to see what um, uh, comments have uh, been made. Um, yeah, uh, Lewis Levy certainly was prescient about uh, Texas being a, a refuge for Jews. In fact, it wasn't um, about 50 years later that about 10,000 Jews came to the United States through Galveston. Uh, with about 3,000 of them staying in, staying in Texas. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Dr. Shachtel, not Rabbi Shachtel. You are correct, Ricky. Ricky, glad you're here. Um, all right. Well, let's continue on. I'm having a lot of fun. Um, one more sort of uh, really neat thing in the um, uh, our collection of... Um, I'm in Judah Shachtel papers. This is a telegram that um, the Shachtels received from uh, President Lyndon Johnson, uh, wishing, uh, wishing he and Barbara a happy wedding anniversary. Um, many of you, I'm sure, remember when uh, Rabbi Shachtel gave the benediction at um, LBJ's inauguration. And they, uh, for a time, enjoyed a very, very close friendship. Uh, so we have this telegram in our um, collections as well. 
Um, let me now, we've, done, we've talked about sort of the history of, of uh, Beth Israel buildings and uh, Dr. Barnson and, and Dr. Schachtel. Um, let me share with you some of the other really fun Beth Israel treasures um, that we have in the collection. So the, the oldest uh, Texas Jewish cookbook that, that we have, I don't know for a fact that it's the oldest one produced, uh, but the oldest one that we have is uh, this Beth Israel Young Ladies Sewing Circle cookbook called Jewish Cookbook Recipes of Worth and Dependence, uh, which was published in 1909. Um, so it's an oldie. And it's just fascinating. I'm hopeful, you know, we, we, we have one um, copy that we acquired, um, I think it was from the Daly family uh, in here in Houston, I wanna say, but I'm hopeful that if we can acquire a second copy, a copy that we can take apart, that we can digitize it. The problem is in order to digitize an old book, you often have to take it apart because you can't get a high quality scan with pages that don't, that don't fold and bend well. Um, but one of the really neat things about this cookbook is that yes, it includes a recipe for cooking and serving a possum dinner. Um, when in Texas, right? So uh, there it is. Uh, there, there's some other really neat recipes in here. If we had more time, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd look at more of them, but uh, uh, there it is. It's just, just great. There's another Beth Israel cookbook I love, which is much more recent. It's, um, oh gosh, what's it called? Space City. It's from the 1960s and it's something in space. I'm blanking on the name, but we have, we have one. Um, I have one on my shelf in my office here. And again, I know that, I know that in the Beth Israel Library, you have both of these cookbooks as well. Um, we have uh, some confirmation photos that we've acquired from uh, Beth Israel families. I know again that Beth Israel has confirmation photographs uh, um, you know, hanging on the wall, which are, which are great to look at, but never hurts to have another copy uh, stored somewhere else. So this is uh, the confirmation class of 1935. And you can see uh, uh, Dr. Barnson there uh, smack in the middle. Almost all women, very few, uh, very few men, but that's to be expected. Um, and um, we have one of the one of the fun uh, treasures that we've received, uh, <clears throat> family with Beth Israel roots, is this confirmation scrapbook, which belonged uh, to Cecily Hart, later Cecily Hart Daly, um, and it's a scrapbook from her confirmation in 1947. And you can see there's a letter from um, Dr. Schachtel here, and a photo of her, and all the thank you notes that she received, and the speech that she gave. Uh, that she gave. And uh, we've digitized this and published it online. And at the end of the presentation, I can show you where to, where to find it if you'd like to go through it yourself. Um, we have uh, some, you know, Beth Israel historical documents like annual reports, which give um, a snapshot into the history of the congregation. So you could see uh, one here from 1944. Um, and um, others. This uh, is a good time, I think, to pivot to another area of interest for us here at the archive, uh, which is documenting the history of Jewish owned businesses here in Houston and in South Texas. Because, um, you know, Jewish, Jewish Houstonians have really contributed quite a lot um, to the development of our city. And you really can't, you really can't tell the story of. Uh, the history of Houston without talking about um, the families who really um, left their mark on, on our city's economy. One of these, of course, is Star Furniture. Um, and uh, I hope you'll be able to hear um, from uh, Shirley Wolf Tumum a little later on. Um, the Wolf family, of course, um, owned Star Furniture and developed it into one of the leading furniture companies in the country. Um, we also have some material uh, from uh, the Weingarten uh, family. This photograph was uh, donated to us by Jack Weingarten. And uh, you can see here uh, Stanford Alexander, a young Stanford Alexander, um, 
in uh, the center of the photograph with uh, Joe Weingarten immediately to his left. And of course, Bernard Weingarten um, next to Joe and Harold Fallick. And um, we, we, we love old photographs like this. We love being able to preserve and digitize and take care of them. Um, and then of course, uh, you know, Jews left their mark on uh, the grocery business in Houston in various ways. Um, another family with deep Beth Israel ties, the Levy family, um, uh, owned Rice Food Market, now uh, Rice Epicurean. And we have uh, some photographs of um, Rice Food Market. Here, here to us at Rice University, of course, Rice Food Market is very important because uh, they really were one of the first anchor businesses in uh, Rice Village. And if you know that... Um, if you know that building in uh, Rice Village where until recently Pier 1 used to be, that was the original Rice Food Market. And if you know, if you walk around the side of the building, there's a little plaque, it's easy to miss, but there's a little plaque um, to the Levy family on the side of that building, uh, noting that it was the original location of Rice Food Market. Uh, and then of course, the Sakowitz family uh, had a long association with Beth Israel. Uh, with a uh, uh, num number of Sakowitzes serving Beth Israel as president. And uh, we have, again, this was an eBay purchase, uh, a number of old Sakowitz department store catalogs. It's fun to, if you're a, if you're a fashion guru, it's, it's fun to go back around the time that I was born and see what, uh, what people were wearing. Um, very, very interesting, fun trip down um, memory lane. Let me again just take a quick break and see what questions and comments uh, people have. Hi, Judy. <laughs> and um, David Wolf has a story for uh, later in the Q&A about meeting um, Rabbi Barnston's son. That would be great. And uh, Barbara Hordern says, my mom and her twin brother, Mitty, are in the confirmation class photo of 1940 along with their cousin, Albert. We don't have that one at the moment, but I know that Judy does, I'm sure. Um, all right. So I just want to, as we sort of wind down here, um, share a couple more things with you and talk about what we've been up to more recently. Um, so in normal times, in pre-pandemic times, um, our primary activity was acquiring documents and photographs. So I'd come to your house and we'd sit in your living room and we'd have coffee and you'd get those boxes from the attic or the garage or the closet, you know, wherever you had them. And we'd sit together and look at them and I'd take notes about family history. And eventually, perhaps you might decide to donate all those materials to us for uh, preservation and research. But because of the pandemic, I can't do that, right? I'm not coming over to your house for coffee and I'm not gonna sit next to you on your couch. Um, I hope to be able to do that in the not too distant future, but I can't, I can't do that now. Um, so the extent that we've been continuing to do that, we've been doing it, we've been meeting people outdoors on their patios with masks on and gloves and it's um, still carrying on, but it's greatly reduced. Um, so I want to tell you about two initiatives that we've been doing here at the Houston Jewish History Archive in the past year, um, both of which uh, touch on, on Beth Israel in some way. So this first initiative is an effort um, to try to capture for future generations what life has been like for us during the pandemic. Um, so we have, in partnership with a number of uh, synagogues and organizations um, in Houston, with their consent, uh, been collecting material about Zoom services and um, other programs and uh, social distances, uh, social distancing, and uh, sermons during the pandemic about the pandemic. How how we can understand what is happening uh, to us through a Jewish lens, and for me. The iconic photograph um, that I use when I, when I talk about this project um, is this screenshot. This is a screenshot, uh, maybe you were there. 
that night. This is a screenshot of Friday night services uh, hosted by Beth Israel back in May of 2020. It feels like 10 years ago, <laughs> uh, but it really wasn't. Um, and uh, Beth Israel and David is uh, here. So David knows this as well as anyone. Beth Israel has been, you know, Beth Israel has been uh, streaming at services um, for a long time. So that's not new. Um, but services where each member of the clergy is um, leading from their living room or, you know, their home office or their studio uh, simultaneously. And, and Cantor Trompeter has, you know, set up a, a recording and performance studio in her home, right? That's unusual. That's different. And so that felt like a moment that we needed to capture because as much as all of us are, are so tired of this and so ready to be back in person and together again, um, this is a moment in the history of American Judaism that, that I as a historian and, and an archivist have a, have a responsibility um, to capture. So we have been trying for the past now almost a year to collect evidence of these signature moments, which to me as a, as a scholar testify to the resilience of Judaism in difficult times and the creativity of our clergy um, and our leadership who um, have been there for us, maybe not there for us physically, um, but but there for us um, digitally as much as they're uh, able to. And we've also been working to collect uh, Rabbi Lyon's blog posts and um, uh, other sermons and, and videos and, and content that Beth Israel and other congregations uh, have produced. Because I guarantee you articles and books will be written in the future about Judaism in the time of coronavirus. And we want to make sure that the Houston Jewish community is part of that story. Um, and so we've been collecting things that seem probably quite mundane, uh, but really, you know, are are not, um, but are but are part of history. All of us every day are are a part of history, and it's it's um, sobering to remember that, but also maybe a little bit exciting. I think. I think Ricky is watching right now. So Ricky, your comment is there, uh, preserved for all time. And uh, Dodie Gaber and um, uh, Bruce Levy is here. And one of the things too that's fun about this for me is that um, Cantor Rollins Simmons of Emmanuel was watching uh, the feed and, and left a comment. You know, one of the, one of the silver linings of, of this otherwise terrible experience is that many of us have been able to quote unquote, shul hop, right? And visit, I think one night in July, I visited like six different congregations on a Friday night from my living room, um, all before sundown, because I'm a, I'm a Shomer Shabbat. Um, so I don't use technology once, you know, once um, Shabbat actually starts. But even before sundown, I was able to visit six synagogues and, and take a picture of their Friday night services. So here's the cantor from Emmanuel checking in on, on uh, Beth Israel and, and, and their own services, which is really a, a wonderful, you know, um, statement to the collegiality that we enjoy here in the Houston Jewish community and the wonders of technology. Um, and then finally, in my presentation today, one of the other things that we've started doing, which we've always wanted to do, but we've been so busy with you know, document collection and, and preservation, we've never really been able to jump into it the way that we wanted, is um, an oral history project. So we've started using Zoom now um, to record uh, interviews with Jewish Houstonians, um, sometimes about their family history, sometimes about their experiences during the, the pandemic. And um, the goal is uh, to record these, to edit them, um, to transcribe them, to, to produce a written uh, record of the conversation and uh, to publish them. So uh, we've been doing about two a month. The editing process is, is um, moving along. Um, and uh, we're, we're still learning, you know, how to do this, how to do this properly. But I wanna just share with you, I think I have a couple minutes. Um, 
I recorded an interview with uh, Shirley Wolf Tumum, um, long affiliated uh, with Beth Israel and her daughter Ellen, um, a few months ago. And we, this is the raw, kind of unedited footage. Um, I'm going to just try to share a couple minutes of this with you so you can take a peek. And uh, in this clip, if I've got the right one, a bit about her family's affiliation with. Sure, of course. And now your family has also had a very long association with uh, Congregation Beth Israel. And you've told me, Shirley, in previous conversations that uh, your class, your group was um, Rabbi Hyman Judah Shachtel's first confirmation class. Is that right? That's right. That's right. He had just kept come to Houston. Mm -hmm. he, what what he, can you tell us about your memories of, of Rabbi Shachtel? Well, he, he was from England, had an English accent, and was a very elegant gentleman. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't think of much of, of our class. We were in the graduation <laughs> class, and he told us we were the most undisciplined group of kids he had ever come in contact with, which I would imagine was true. Wow. Yeah. I can't imagine that, Mom, with you. <laughs> I imagine you being very disciplined. No, very undisciplined. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Rabbi, Rabbi Shachtel was also quite the orator. I've had the opportunity from the archive to listen to a number of his speeches. And yes. quite, quite a voice. Mm -hmm. Beautiful voice. And was very involved in the interfaith movement in Houston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was, uh, loved to, to be in the center of things. Right. And I know you remember when he gave the benediction at uh, President Johnson's um, inauguration, what a, what a moment that was for the community. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I don't remember much, but I just remember that, that he had been involved and knew uh, the, the president. And so was called on to, to give the the invocation mm -hmm. and did it beautifully. And we were all very, very proud. Of course. And there's a story. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's about all I remember about that, but but we were so proud of him. Yeah. And you've you've told me before that you were instrumental in creating the gift shop at Beth Israel, is that right? Yes, Barbara Shachtel, his wife and I, decided that there, there should be a, a gift shop. Um, there had not been one of, in any form, and I don't think that many existed. I, I don't know why we decided it should, there should be one. So we were given a tiny little office space that had once brought belonged to Mrs. Brilly, the head of the Sunday school. And in that little room, we set up a, a showcase and we decided I would be the buyer and Barbara would be the, the bookkeeper and the scheduling of people to, who could act as salespeople. And we made a great team. And really, it was very hard to find merchandise. Uh, I don't know where I find it. It was not readily available. There were no catalogs or things that I could purchase from. But somehow I imagined to find mezuzahs and, and different small things mm -hmm. and we were very successful i'm sure you were i'm sure you were and it was at a time you know when you couldn't just go on amazon and 
buy any kind of Judaica items that you uh, that you might like. So I'm sure it provided a great service to the um, to the Houston Jewish community. And it's also so. Um, yeah, we'll hopefully get that footage, you know, edited and, and uh, cleaned up a bit. Uh, Zoom has its drawbacks. You know, the audio will, will cut out a little bit. And um, sometimes we end, people end up talking over each other. But while we're all trying to, to stay socially distant, this is a great way to capture stories like, like that one. So we're, we're hoping to continue this oral history program on Zoom um, and develop it. I know that the hour is almost done. And um, there are a number of... Um, uh, comments, which are which are great. I don't have time to to cover all of them, but uh, they range from Star Furniture to the Possum Cookbook to uh, Jacob de Cordova, another very very early uh, and important um, Texas Jew, and um, Shachtel's book reviews, uh, as Beverly notes, were were legendary. Uh, hundreds of people would would show up to hear Rabbi Shachtel um, review the latest the latest book. Um, okay, I am going to share with you now just a couple of things, uh, resources for you really to explore on your own. Um, this, first of all, is our digital repository. So as we digitize things like that um, Cecily Hart scrapbook that I, that I showed you, when they get published, they get published here. And I'll share this link um, in the chat window so that you can swipe it not swipe it, but so that you can um, copy it and keep it for your reference. I'm told that Mimi uh, Goldschmidt would like to be, um, would like to go ahead. Go ahead, Mimi. Mimi, are you there? Just unmute, Mimi. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. I'm. You're mentioning business people and so forth. There are a tremendous number of, of important scientists in Houston at Baylor Medical School and UT Medical School and in San Antonio and so forth. And I don't hear any mention about, uh, about uh, doctors, and, including Ed Septimus of our own, um, of our own, temple and so forth. And that would be nice for you to, to mention the fact that that uh, MDs and faculty members that are Jewish at different schools, Houston, U of Houston and uh, Baylor and so forth are also important in making contributions Jewishly. Yes, uh, thank you for that. Con I mean, obviously, in, you know, in the course of an hour, you can't you can't cover everything, but um, the the contributions of of Houston physicians to um, to the field of medicine and to the city of Houston, of course, is legendary. Uh, Houston, as many of you know, right, had the um, the Jewish Institute for Medical Research, um, which still exists but is now part of, of of Baylor, but was a gift of the Houston Jewish community. Um, to the to the medical center and um, many distinguished physicians, Dr. Melnick and others um, have been affiliated with it over the years. Um, I guess I'll have to come back uh, in a year and, and we'll look at we'll look at um, Houston Jewish scientists and doctors. So I'm showing you um, hopefully not that long. Hopefully not that long. Okay. Well, here's our uh, digital catalog. Um, and here's where you can uh, see oral histories that we've completed, um, as well as some other ons and ends from um, other, uh, congreg uh, other congregations and institutions in um, the city, some of which uh, touch on Beth Israel, um, I guess. Those of you who know Joe Buchanan, Joe does a lot. Um, for the world of Jewish music. I had the privilege of interviewing. He was the first interview that we did, the first Zoom interview. And this is a good one. If you like, if you like Joe Buchanan, make sure you go back and watch that one. Um, so on and so forth. Oh, I can't resist. Can't resist. Because it's uh, it's gonna be lunchtime for me in a second. So those of you who uh, grew up in Houston, lived in Houston a long time, you'll remember Alfred's, 
which before there was Kenny and Ziggy's, there was Alfred's. It was the quintessential Houston Jewish delicatessen. Um, again, on eBay, now you guys, you got to promise you're not going to buy stuff on eBay now because I'm giving away all my secrets. Here is an Alfred's menu from the old uh, deli that we found and bought and digitized. And here it is. And what I love about this is not only did we, you know, digitize it, but I can even tell you the exact day that this menu was used. Like a fossil, somebody kept the daily specials paper inside the menu. January 4th, 1966. Look at this. You can get chicken soup with matzo balls uh, for 50 cents. Don't tell Ziggy. Don't tell Ziggy Gruber. Um, uh, appetizer plated gefilte fish with horseradish for 85 cents. And um, let's see, combination chicken liver and corned beef sandwich for a buck 25. Wow. Anyway, just cool. And this is all here for you. Um, you, can, you can read this, download it, um, do what you like. Let's see. Um, I promised you that link and let me give it to you. All right, so that is our digital scholarship uh, link. And then um, last but not least, as I know we're gone a little bit over, thank you for your patience, everybody, is our website. So this is our uh, homepage where um, you can find out more about the archive. Um, if you'd like to support us um, with a donation, you can support our work here. But also, um, here is a link to our library guide. So if you're wondering what's in the archive, what do you have? This is our best um, and most up-to-date catalog of materials. It also has my contact information. Um, so here you can see our list of individuals and families that have donated materials and Shirley Barish and Askenaz uh, pop up right away. Um, Beth Israel families or families with a connection to Beth Israel um, and some others. Our collection on, uh, from Rabbi Hyman Judah Shachtel is here as well. The uh, organizations and businesses that I mentioned like Star Furniture our synagogue collections, um, rare books in uh, Texas Jewish history, and of course, our collection of cookbooks, uh, which is ever growing. What's so, the, uh, What's the website, Josh, that we go to for that? Yeah, let me back up a step. Back up a few steps. Um, so here it is. It's jewishstudies.rice.edu backslash Houston Jewish History Archive. And I will put it uh, in the chat again for you guys to um, take. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. The, um, the famous story of Rabbi Shaktel, of course, many of us know it, but when he was interviewing for the position of senior rabbi, Congregation Beth Israel, everybody was worried because it was in August and they didn't want to scare him away because of the heat. And so they whisked him from one place to one place and never let him stand outside for too long. And when he got back home, everyone asked him, so how was Houston? And his first answer right out of the gate was freezing. <laughs> <laughs> well, Josh, we can't thank you enough for putting this together and sharing this with us. It has been a wonderful uh, program, a wonderful hour. I know that there, we could go on and on with all of the different stories and, and the research that you've done. It's really remarkable. It's really fascinating. And we are so glad that uh, you were able to make time to be with us today. And uh, we look forward to many more opportunities to share together and to learn from you and from the archives and from our community that has uh, put this together and al allowed us all